Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to another season of Talking with Traders with me, Garth McKenzie. This is the sixth season of the podcast, and we're into our third year since the podcast began in 2020. Once again, IG have come on board as sponsor and agreed to fund this podcast for another season. We really are privileged to have such a global leader in CFDs trading as our podcast sponsor. Over the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe to bring you their market insights. I'll be digging in to find out what makes them tick, how they see the markets in the year ahead, and what techniques they will use to succeed in the markets. Some of the guests will be returning guests from previous seasons, and some will be new guests that I've managed to convince to join me to give up their time and share their insights. As we enter 2023, there's as much uncertainty as ever around where the markets may be headed in the next 12 months. We've just come off a horrid year for investors in 2022, where a typical 60-40 portfolio delivered its worst annual return in several decades. But what of 2023? Will the US lead the world into a global recession, or will the central banks manage to achieve a soft landing for the global economy? Will inflation come under control as base effects kick in and supply bottlenecks open up? Will US earnings hold up in the face of a weak economy, or will they disappoint? Will we see continued weakness in the US dollar? I'll be asking these and many other questions to my guests in the coming weeks. The idea behind these podcasts is for you to get a variety of views from a broad spectrum of market professionals. None of this is intended to be seen as financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking and to weigh up what possible paths the market may follow in the year ahead. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. That way you'll be notified of upcoming episodes as they get released. Once again, thanks to IG for sponsoring this podcast for a third consecutive year. Thanks for joining me, and please enjoy Season 6 of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders. This is the first episode of 2023, and it's a delight to welcome back Nick van Rensburg. He's a macro strategist, independent macro strategist, big thinker, and consultant to a couple of funds. Uh, he and I do a little bit of work outside of this podcast as well. Uh, Nick, welcome back. It's always good to have you on the podcast. Uh, I know the last time I, I, I had you on, you said uh, you hoped I'd learned my lesson about having you on. <laughs> I haven't learned my lesson. I, I've learned the lesson that I enjoy having you on the podcast because your <laughs> insights are always intriguing. And I think as we kick off 2023, it's fitting that you and I have a conversation about what the year ahead might look like and, uh, you know, what what some of the tail risks might be, et cetera, et cetera. So welcome back. Thank you. Thanks That's, for having me. Okay. Well, thank you. I will uh, <laughs> I'll learn my lesson again this time, maybe. <laughs> um, Nick, let's get straight into the the meaty stuff. Inflation is a topic we want to kick off this conversation with. Obviously, that has been a huge issue in markets and in the global economy over the last year. Um, particularly last year, we saw inflation rising to, you know, in double digits in certain places in the developed world. It does now seem like we're getting on top of inflation or the inflation rates are beginning to come down. It seems to me like inflation peaked in around about sort of July of last year in much of the developed world, and it's been coming down since then. What is your view on it, of giving, taking into account the base effects, et cetera, that we're coming off of, you know, we're lapping pretty high numbers from last year. What is your thought on that? And then I suppose leading on from that, what do we, what do we make in terms of central banks and, and are they getting on top of inflation now? I think if we step back a bit, the, um, you remember when we were in lockdown, people used to buy a lot of goods, you know, computers and iPhones and so forth. And good inflation went up a lot. There were also issues with supply out of China. And those have all been resolved. So goods inflation is now coming down quite rapidly. A lot of durable goods are, have got negative inflation or deflation. And that's dragging the, the um, CPI index lower. The services element is still very strong. 
and that has not rolled over yet. There are some indications it's starting to roll over, but a lot of that's driven by wages. And uh, wages have peaked somewhere around 7%. It's now just still above 6%. So the biggest long-term risk for inflation remains wages and therefore services. And, um, but the, the average is undoubtedly coming down. And then the second issue is, is that we're starting to lap the peak quarter. You know, the highest inflation last year was between April and June. We peaked in June at about 9.1%. Uh, and since then, we've been coming lower. Uh, by the second quarter of this year, we're going to lap that high base. And that base was there because of the war. If you remember, mm -hmm. a year ago, the war started at the end of February. And by March, April, oil was $125 and gasoline was, you know, significantly higher than where it's now. And all those prices are down significantly. I mean, today, oil's around $60, $76, So it's well down. So I can imagine that January and February, maybe there's some chance that it could surprise on the upside. But from March onwards, it's more likely that it'll surprise on the downside because the uh, just due to base effects. And then there's also a methodology change by the um, BLS, which, you know, they compile the CPI data. I believe that'll make the base even a little bit higher because it's using a, a different base than what it previously was meant to use. So uh, that similarly kicks in from somewhere around March, April this year. So inflation should definitely be trending down and trending down probably quite fast in the second quarter. Um, that's the year over year numbers. Month-on-month -month numbers could be affected by a China reopening. You know, it's unclear as to how inflationary that'll be. I mean, on the commodity side, so PPI, it should boost PPI when they open because they'll be buying in more commodities. As far as CPI is concerned, that'll take a couple of months before, you know, we see what demand is like in China. They've just come out of their Lunar New Year holidays, so um, the economy is only officially really opening this week. You know, before that, there was significant absenteeism, you know, as COVID spread very rapidly through the country. Mm -hmm. That point that you made about the BLS adjusting the methodology that they use for calculating inflation is quite an interesting point. And it's something that I know you've picked up on, but I haven't really seen it being actively reported elsewhere, certainly not in any, in any significant way. Um, can you shed a little more light on what that means? I mean, you mentioned that it sets the base higher. If the base is going to be higher, I mean, I guess, does that also then mean that, that, that the actual inflation readings looking ahead could come lower than what anybody expects? Could we even see yes. deflation because of the base effect? Um, I'm not sure if we get to deflation, but we'd get closer to 3 or 2% than what we otherwise would have. Uh, it's quite contentious, you know, I've asked some of the big brokers like Morgan Stanley, they seem to disagree, they don't think it's material. Pantheon Mac Macro, which is a well-rated econ economic team, they believe it is quite material. And um, Luke Romans and others also believe that it's quite material. The Essentially, what they're doing now is they're only using one year to determine what the mix of the basket is. And the year they'll be using to compare against is 2021, which was kind of when the U.S. started uh, opening up. You were at the tail end of all the good spending, you know, and then um, services started kicking in later that year. You know, if you remember, the vaccine came out at the end of 2020. So that was kind of, you know, kind of a reopening year. But the first half, it was still very much goods driven. Yeah. So what that would mean is that goods would have a bigger weight in the index than it otherwise would have had. And therefore, as goods are falling, you know, it's falling off a bigger weight. So if you imagine, let's say something was 10% of the index, it then went up 50% to 15. You know, now we're falling off 15 instead of, let's say, off 12 and a half when you were using a two and a half year base. So um, uh, if you now fall five or 10%, it's, you know, one and a half instead of one and a quarter. Yeah. Those are the kind of uh, effects that's uh, coming through. Okay. It's, it's only really relevant from the March number, which will be reported in April. Mm. Okay. It, it kicks in from January this year, but the base effects is not that relevant for Jan Fed. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously, the central banks and, and particularly the Fed um, is watching that very closely. Um, their target is for inflation to get back to 2%. I mean, with this recalculation, if it does get back down to 2 3%, I, mean, I wonder if it does get back there. But, um, you know, what is the outlook then for interest rates? I mean, we, you and I are recording this on the 31st of January, just for anybody wondering. 
We are expecting the Fed to announce an interest rate hike tomorrow evening, being the 1st of February, expecting 25 basis points. And I think the general expectation is that there might be another hike of 25 basis points after that in March, and then they probably pause. And some out there are thinking that the Fed maybe even pivots later in this year, which means they would start to cut interest rates. Which I don't know. I'd say, I, yeah, I'd say that's think. only that's only likely if the inflation falls very fast. So if mm. the base effects are indeed material, then that is possible. Um, I don't think it changed anything to the to the two hikes ahead of us. We'll obviously hear what they want to do tomorrow night when they come out. And um, was it tonight? No, it's, it's uh, Wednesday night. <laughs> the first. I, I forgot which day of the week it is. I know you've been um, very busy presenting to <laughs> to clients all week. You said before the call that you you you're feeling like you've got brain damage. You've been working so hard. So I'll forgive you that one. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes this week the Fed will come back and tell us what they want to do. Um, the issue for the Fed at the moment is that the economy is starting to slow. If you look at coincident indicators, while inflation is still significantly above their forecast. So this is the first meeting where they've got a clash between their deal mandate. The deal mandate is for is growth and inflation. And uh, inflation is still high, even though it's falling, but growth is now starting to slow. We're not seeing it in the jobs data yet, but that one would expect you know, to see in the near future and coming months at least. So is it possible that the Fed pauses sooner? I suppose that is possible. If the base effects and the methodology gets inflation down, you know, faster than what's generally expected, then obviously we could have rate cuts later. But, you know, the, the one uncertainty about that is we've had significant decreases in the price of gas and oil uh, during China's um, infections, you know, COVID infections and absenteeism. Mm. When they fully reopen, I can imagine that oil would probably trade higher and so may natural gas and other, you know, other commodities. So we'll see how that affects the month-on-month data. Because, you know, each month the number comes up and it's, let's say, 6.5% year over year, but the month-on-month data is 0.3. There is a risk that the 0.3 goes up higher, you know, to zero, you know, 0.5. And yeah. if you then start annualizing that data, that's something that the Fed may be watching because a, a half a percent a month rate is like 6% per annum, which mm-hmm. is, again, very far away from their target. Yeah. The recent month-on-month uh, numbers were very low and, you know, kind of indicate that inflation is slowing rapidly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll watch that very carefully out into the end of this year. The next issue we wanted to chat about is the US dollar. Uh, Obviously, that is also a a, a big driver of risk assets, generally speaking. Uh, Up until the middle of last year, we saw a very strong US dollar, and that was always seen as a headwind to risk assets. That was accompanied with falling equity markets, falling uh, bonds, et cetera. But since October last year, the dollar has made quite an, a significant about turn. And if you look at the US dollar index, the DXY, and I was just having a look at the actual extent of the the loss of the dollar index over that time, it's, it's down 11% since the peak in October. So that's only four months ago. And the dollar is 11% weaker um, against the basket that makes up that that dollar US dollar index. That's pretty substantial. I mean, I know it's at a at an inflection point now. There's quite an important support zone at about 101, I think it is, on the US dollar index. Yes. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because obviously what the dollar does also has very significant implications for other asset classes like equities, like commodities, etc. Uh, Let's take a step back just to look at the big picture. If we go back to 2008, the US started outperforming European equities or rest of world equities. And the under, you know, the the, the outperformance by the US was very, very significant. I think the S&P probably outperformed Europe by at least 80% or so. And um, the, uh, yeah, so by a very significant amount. And a lot of the flow that went out of the rest of the world and into U.S. equities and U.S. bonds strengthened the dollar over that period. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, in my my view, a lot of the strength in the dollar is driven by portfolio flows. So it is foreigners buying U.S. equities, foreigners buying U.S. bonds. And the collective, the, 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 the number 
between the two is around $17.5 trillion over that period up to about 2021, of which $11.5 trillion went into US equities. Now, $17.5 trillion is about 75% of US GDP, so it's a very significant number, you know, the, the, the money that flowed into the US over that period of time. The tick data from the Treasury stops in June 2021, and we're awaiting the new 2022 data. But if I had to guess, I'd say at least until September, there was very significant money flowing into the US. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to last year, you know, the war started in Europe and China sided with Russia. So there was a reason for people to take money out of Europe, UK and China and put it into the US. Now, funny enough, yeah, the UK outperformed despite that fact. It outperformed, but everyone else underperformed. And China underperformed very badly until the end of um, October around the CCP meeting. Yeah. Now, since September, I think the Japanese especially has been sellers of foreign assets, of which at least half of it's in the US. And I suspect that there's been some asset allocators also taking money out. It started at the end of September into Europe, and Europe has now outperformed the S&P by about 30% since then. And it started for EM at the end of October, beginning of November, and the EMs outperformed the S&P by about 20% since then. Now, a lot of people are saying right now, people are overweight EM and overweight Europe, which, um, you know, considering the picture I've just painted for you from 2009, that's not quite laughable. It's pre-laughaughable. So... Um, Short I guess it, term, it, it might depends. Be. Yeah, I guess it depends on on the what relative period you're looking over. As you say, if you're yeah. looking back all the way to 2008, then then they've hardly even begun. Hardly but if, begun, you, yes. if you're looking yeah. at it over a one or two year period, then it might look like they've underweighted the US and gone overweight everywhere else. But yeah, I mean, let's big, look at the bigger picture. Yeah. So if you look at a let's say a four month period, I would, I would agree that that's right. And I think the it's pretty clear that people have been selling U.S. assets because it's the only way the dollar really weakens by that much in such a short period of time. Now, if you ask yourself, why did it happen? I think the reason to be in the U.S. last year is because high energy prices hurt Europe. And what happened since August is that the net gas price in Europe went from about 350 down to 55. Yeah. So it's a very significant fall. And Europe was quite lucky that it had quite a mild winter. So the result is the pain to Europe is less than what we thought. And you're now seeing that economic surprises are actually surprising on the upside in Europe. In the US, on the other hand, economic surprises have rolled over. So the economy is doing weaker than what economists are expecting. Uh, if you look at um, emerging markets, about a third of that is China. And China bottomed in quite a big sell-off at the end of October. And since then... You know, they reopened, but they're not just, they didn't just reopen slowly the way I anticipated them to. They reopened really, really fast. Mm. You know, I mean, basically on a Monday, they announced that from Wednesday, you don't need to use the COVID app anymore. Mm. And, um, you know, in the West, there's always been this belief that they are very strong on planning and very diligent. And it's pretty clear that that's not the case. Mm. You know, it was, it, they've done 180 degree turn on virtually every policy that they were, you know, that they had before um, the CCP plenum. So China is now fully in reopen mode. They opened in the middle of winter, which was unthinkable. Um, but what that meant is that people got sick. A lot of people died. They obviously hide the numbers. The infections went, you know, throughout the country. It's still doing that. Absenteeism in cities went way up. Factory production fell because there weren't enough people at factories. And now that the Lunar New Year holidays are over, I suspect that February is the year that they, uh, sorry, the, the month where production really starts increasing and it'll ramp up month of, you know, month after month. So March should be better than Feb and April should be better than March. Okay. So Chinese growth is now uh, recovering very significantly of much lower base. So that's one positive that was a negative during the zero COVID policy. Like we said, the uh, European energy prices are, much lower so that helps europe and um, then on the other hand you know despite the fact that the fed has hiked rates significantly there's a goldman sachs financial conditions index and that index is, has you know liquidity or financial conditions have loosened very significantly over the last couple of months it's made up of five different um 
uh, macro assets of which the dollar is one. So a strong dollar is a tightening financial conditions and a falling dollar is loosening. Yeah. As you've just mentioned, you know, we've had very significant falling dollars. So therefore conditions have loosened. Similarly, the 10 year bond yields have fallen from 4.33 to about three and a half percent. The S&P is up maybe 10 or 15 percent from its lows. Uh, credit spreads have tightened. And literally the only thing that is tighter than before is the policy rate, you know, which is uh, one year ago, they haven't, you know, the, the Fed haven't even hiked once. Yeah. They only hiked from March last year when rates were at like 25 basis points. And now we're at four and a half percent. So um, that actually will bring us to another point, which we'll discuss later. And that's the money market. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, but yeah, dollar to get back to that, I mean, it's at an inflection point now, I guess we see this area on the dollar index around 101 ish is, is a technical support level. I guess we need to see if it holds that and bounces. If it does bounce in the near term, I suppose that could be seen as a bit of a headwind in the near term for, for risk assets. If it fails to hold that support, falls below 101, falls below 100, um, that would be bullish. Yeah. Yeah, so we um, the dollar broke its short-term uptrend around 105, somewhere around there, mm-hmm. and it's fallen to horizontal support around 101. So if it bounces here, I can see it probably bouncing to 104, 105. I don't think it'll get much further than that. Yeah. Um, so that will be a short-term setback for EM, short-term setback for European assets and potentially gold, uh, czar, you know, South African rand. So, uh, but really, just have, a consolidation in all of those, I suppose, it's not something too serious. Yeah, because I, I, you know, the the uh, we've discussed the CPI data and the base effect, so it's going to be quite difficult for the Fed to remain very hawkish. Like I can get that they would keep rates high for long, but I mean that's not incrementally more hawkish than what they are right now. You know, mm. hike another twenty five or fifty basis points, but I mean that's not the end of the world. We're already no. up at four and a half percent. So the changes now are quite marginal. You know, last year we went through cumulative 75 basis point hikes, mm-hmm. which was a much more hawkish stance than what we've got at the moment. Yeah. Now, if, if the Fed is quite hawkish this week, then I would anticipate the dollar bounces maybe to 104, 105. I would be surprised if it goes higher than that. And I suspect then it sells off again. Uh, if it doesn't, if they're quite dovish, then I can see us break through 101 and my target for the year would be around 94. And that would be a very bullish outcome for rest of world assets because yeah. it, it basically weakness shows that money is leaving U.S. assets and flowing into the rest of the world. And I think the, um, the one stat that is worth remembering is that U.S. equities got to 63% of global equity market cap last year. It's now at 60. So it's you know fallen a little bit, but it's not fallen by that much. And this is an economy that's 25% of the world's GDP. So it's got 25% of world GDP and 60% of equity market cap. On the bond side, it's got 41% you know, of the global aggregate bond index as a weight. You know, and again, it's 25% of GDP. So US assets are very much over-owned still. And I can foresee that for the next decade, they would be selling of US assets and buying of rest of world assets. Yeah. That's my base case. Then that's that's something actually that I wanted to to chat to you about in terms of the next question is that we we've, we've begun to see this shift away from US um, moving more un- underweight. Let's not say underweight because, like you said, it's laughable to call it underweight. Less overweight the US, and you're starting to see up weighting of the rest of the world. And I think we've seen a little bit of that moving into the South African market in an EM context amongst other way elsewhere. You know, we've seen it in the emerging markets ETF. We've seen it in China and so on. But I mean, in terms of the, the rest of the world, where do you see possibly the best value or the best opportunities for some of that money that's going to be leaving the US to then go to to find a home? So Japan is the largest market outside of the U.S. So if you look at the 40%, that's not U.S., approximately 13 of the 40 is Japan. Okay. Then another five and a half each is uh, China and the U.K. And the U.K. is still a very under-owned market. So yeah. I still very much like the U.K. Mm. Uh, then you've got a whole bunch of European markets, and SA is about 1% of that 40, one out of yeah. the 40. Yeah. So um 
I can imagine that the, you know, that money flows, uh, I think we've discussed it previously, you know, the 60%, which is the US is a highly liquid market. Mm -hmm. The top 10 shares, they trade 14 times more than the top 10 shares in the, in the 40. So this is why you tend to have very steep moves when the money flows out of the US and into the rest of the world. You know, $10 billion is just not the same in the rest of the world than what it is in the US. You know, $10 billion is less than what Apple trades in a day. Yeah. But that's maybe three times what Tencent trades in a day, or I can't remember exactly how much Tencent trades, but roughly like something like that. So um, if the money keeps flowing out of the US, the dollar should weaken, other currencies sh should strengthen, and valuations in the rest of the world would go up. Yeah. Now, currently, the rest of the world valuations are significantly below US valuations. And um, I was listening to a Goldman score the other day, and they were saying that the S&P is still in the top 25% most expensive versus history. And, uh, you know, so the U.S. market for me is just unattractive on many, many, uh, you know, for many reasons. One is it's had no redemptions during this whole sell-off. Nobody sold out of equities. Um, if you're wondering what, how can that be and the market's down, the funds themselves sold their equity positions down and bought cash, but the investors in the funds have not redeemed. Now, normally in any kind of recession, you would get somewhere between 2 and 7% of the AUM would get redeemed. And that's forced selling, and that's how you get capitulation, and you know, it clears the decks and the market can rally from there. We have not seen that yet. And um, as we've discussed before, the baby boomers, are they own half U.S. wealth. Their median age this year will be 67, and they're very heavily exposed to equities. And then, you know, along with that, we've got a new asset class which didn't exist for a long period of time called money market. One year ago, you could earn like somewhere between five and 15 basis points in the money market, and now you can earn four and a quarter percent at Schwab. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a very real asset class. Now, I suspect that you may only see money flowing into the money market significantly from the second or third quarter, you know, because with the next hike and the hike thereafter, the money market rates are going to continue edging higher, yeah. maybe four and a quarter, four and a half, four point seven five, and you know, in the second quarter we should see the year the year CPI numbers come down. So right now, if I pitch it to you, you might say, "Well, inflation is six six and a half percent, and I'm only earning four and a quarter percent. I'm losing." But you know, maybe by the second quarter, sometime you know, you, CPI might be similar to the money market rate or even below. And if that's the case, then I can imagine a lot of baby boomers would sell U.S. equities and buy, uh, put their money in the money market. Mm -hmm. So safer. So you're getting almost equivalent to inflation rate in a money market fund. You're not losing purchasing power and there's no risk. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think back like in 2000 and the dot-com boom, they were, I think, around 42, 44. So they still had plenty of time to make money back. And 2008, they were in the early 50s. They still had plenty of time to make the money back. At 67, you're not working anymore, so you don't have any time to make the money back. You know, and you're withdrawing from your savings every year. So if you have a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent down year, you know, a 5 percent withdrawal become a 10 percent of your capital withdrawal. And those are the kind of things that baby boomers should be thinking about now. According to Merrill's, they still got about 60 percent of their portfolios and equities, which I think is. Um, yeah, unbelievably high. Yeah. It's a very risky proposition. The um, the other thing on the U.S. equity side is that um, BlackRock said their advice to define benefit pension funds in the U.S. is that they should be selling equities and buying bonds. And uh, one of the interesting things about last year is even though the asset side of their portfolio has fallen, both the bonds and the equities, the liabilities have fallen more because the discount rate has risen so significantly last year. And as a result of that, a lot of these defined pension funds are actually now fully funded. And after, being, after spending a decade of being underfunded. Mm -hmm. Now, as a corporate, you have to put in money when there's a hole in the pension fund. So if I was uh, you know, representing the corporate on the board of the pension fund, I would be telling them to be buying a lot of bonds and selling equities. And the estimates for those numbers are somewhere between half a trillion and a trillion um, of bond buying by pension funds. And against that, that they would be selling probably equities, which is the riskiest asset. You know, withdrawing from private equity, redeeming their private equity investments, and also um, selling equities. Yeah. 
So again, U.S. equities, you know, uh, just see supply. Mm-hmm. So the higher the more the, the S and P goes, I think the more supply we'll see. It's just a matter of when. You know, could it rally ten percent from here? Maybe, but I don't think it's uh, something that I would invest in on that kind of basis. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's interesting. All right. And then the last part of our conversation that we wanted to touch on are some of the tail risks that we can look out for uh, in the year ahead. I know we before the call we were talking about black swans, and it seems like like somebody out there is breeding black swans these days because we've, we've had a lot more of them in recent <laughs> years than than in the past. Um, I mean, some of these tail risks are known. Well, when I mean, the ones we know are the knowns, I suppose it's the unknown unknowns that are the ones that 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 hurt and surprise us the most. But let's just quickly talk about some of the tail risks that we are aware of and what that might mean. For 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 the markets going forward, I mean, I know you you said the first one you're watching is the debt ceiling in the US this year. Yeah, so in uh, 2011, well, actually, before we get to that, around every 18 months, there's a debt ceiling in the US, and every you know they always agree and they just increase the debt ceiling. Yeah. Uh, in 2011, uh, it ended up in a protracted fight because the Tea Party was part of the Republicans and they wanted to cut the budget. Mm. They succeeded in cutting the budget by about 1.2% back then. The U.S. sovereign debt got downgraded, and that's something I want to just circle back to because I think that will happen this year again, or it's got a high risk of happening. Mm. Uh, And the political division is obviously very high. So the fraction of the Republican Party that, um, you know, uh, Speaker McCarthy had to bend to any speakership um, contest uh, they want to cut the budget. And then Joe Biden said that he doesn't want to negotiate at all on the debt ceiling. He's not giving up any spending. So the U.S. hit its debt ceiling about two weeks ago. It'll run out of money sometime in June or July. And at that time, that'll be crunch time. So I think Q2, we're going to have a debt ceiling problem. They usually leave it until the last moment because there's a bit of, you know, to and fro and then it gets serious when we get very close. Mm-hmm. So sometime around there, sometime between, let's say, June and August is when it's uh, crunch time. And I suspect that's when the sovereign debt downgrade risk would also increase. Now, normally, that's quite bullish for bonds because you tend to issue less, although the Treasury came out with an issuance schedule that was unbelievable yesterday where they intend to issue quite a lot of bonds. I'm not sure how they think they're going to get through it. They're basically assuming the debt ceiling is going to get negotiated and solved very soon. I, I think that is an incorrect assumption. Um, and equities tend to ignore it until the very last minute. So in 2011, I think it fell about 16% in the last couple of weeks before crunch time. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of an equity risk for the second quarter. The dollar traded roughly sideways during 2011. I suspect it could trade down this year. You know, after what happened with the, the Russian central bank and the freezing of their assets, there's definitely less foreign demand um, for U.S. treasuries than what there was before. You know, one of the things that happened last year is we basically said we believe in uh, private ownership, you know, unless you're somebody we don't like, then we take all your assets. And if you think about what that means, you know, let's say you in a country where there's a dubious relationship between your government Mm -hmm. uh, and the U.S., you could lose 100% of your capital, which is more than what you can lose even in Argentina. Yeah. which defaults, you know, every couple of years. Yeah. Like your money is safer in Argentina than in U.S. treasuries if you're an enemy of the U.S., yeah. which is quite a mind shift, you know, because previously people would invest in the risk-free U.S. treasury irrespective. And I don't think that's the case if you potentially in Saudi or the Chinese sovereign wealth fund or, you know, and a myriad of other countries that are somehow aligned to them, Pakistan mm-hmm. or so forth. So I would, I'd say that the, the foreign demand for U.S. Treasuries is probably not going to increase that much. There is demand increasing from the um, pension funds, the defined ben- benefit pension funds, as we discussed. I don't think there's that much demand from baby boomers. I, if I was them, I'd put my money into the money market, especially if the Fed's going to keep rates high for a period of time. Yeah. You know, then um, yeah, that's quite a good return, and I'd be doing fixed deposits and locking in and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's good to think what else. Okay, so the debt ceiling is, is uh, an issue for the second quarter. 
And then when we move on from there, Israel had an election in November and they've got the most far-right government they've had since inception, which means that they are more likely to leave their borders and, you know, interfere in countries like Iran and elsewhere. And um, we saw that over the weekend when they drones attacked um, Iranian facilities. Mm -hmm. Iran, on the other end, has got pro you know, protests at home, which seems to be a bit more successful than previous protests. So they may also want to venture across their border at some point to create a diversion. And Iran's a well-known sponsor of global terrorism. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that Iran, Israel is probably one of the kind of maybe lesser known terrorists out there. And that would be something that could boost the price of oil. Yeah. So, and, and if oil were to rally significantly, then um, that's obviously an inflation issue. Yes. So that's where, that where it, where it becomes a bit of a variable. Mm. China, Taiwan, I don't think is imminent at the moment. I thought it was more imminent before, but the um, Xi Jinping has basically reversed almost every policy that he stood for in October has been reversed by now. I believe it's temporary, not permanent, but it has been quite spectacular that they've just reversed on virtually everything from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, allowing new games, not clamping down on Chinese tech companies anymore, but actually trying to help them. Uh, you know, there was just a myriad of things that got reversed. There. So I think it's quite unlikely that he would do anything in the short term. The only way in the short term that, you know, they would do something as if Taiwan did something like declare independence, which I think is quite unlikely. They've got elections in 2024, maybe then. Uh, or if the U.S. baits them, you know, into a situation where they feel that they, you know, can't do, in, can't do nothing. Yeah. So that would be the next. Um, the Bank of Japan is an interesting risk. They, you know, Japan is basically the, the home of the carry trade. Yeah. And they've had lower rates for the longest period of time. So since the 90s, they've had very low rates and they've had very low returns in the equity market. And people, there was just no inflation for a very, very long period of time. Now, a year ago in March, um, they weakened the yen from about 115 up to 152 and it's now back at around 130. Yeah. And the intention of that was to help the exporters to make super profits and then to pressure the exporters to give salary increases that are significant to their staff because they want to get rid of the deflation mindset that is built up over 30 years in Japan and get some level of inflation mindset going. Now, CPI is lifting quite fast, and one of the biggest insurers have just given a 5% salary increase, so it's starting to happen. Mm -hmm. But what obviously happened in between is I don't think they anticipated that banks around the rest of the world, central banks in the rest of the world, would hike rates as steeply as what they did. You know, So if you think at the time, you know, the U.S. was about to do its first, I think, 50 basis point hike, and it had no hikes on the, you know, on, on the table at the time. And yeah. since then, we've, you know, the gap between Japanese rates and U.S. rates have gone up very significantly. Yeah. So today, uh, in December, actually, they increased the yield cap from 25 basis points to 50. Yep. And the more they increase that yield cap, the more likely it is the Japanese investors, which are the most global investors out there because they had no opportunities at home, mm. that they would repatriate money back home. And that would mean that they would sell dollars and buy yen and you know, buy Japanese equities, Japanese bonds, and so forth. The, the funny thing is that you think, why would you buy something at 50 basis points when you can buy US treasuries at three and a half? The issue is that they hedge the currency. And because yeah. the short rates, the, the, the policy rates are so high at four and a half percent, you actually lose a percent hedging. So your, your yield as a Japanese investor investing in U.S. treasuries on a currency edge basis is minus 100 basis points. Oh, and you can, yeah. you, can, you can get plus 50 basis points in Japan. So therefore, it's much more likely that they'll take the money back home. Mm -hmm. If, um, you know, the, the increase from 25 to 50 was a surprise and then Kuroda, the governor, is retiring on the 8th of April. So it's unclear at the moment if the replacement will have the same, will stick to the existing policy or just shift the yield cap up. Yeah. I believe they'll have to shift it up because, I mean, Reuters reported that in January alone, they spent like 2.5% of GDP trying to keep the um, bond yields at half a percent, which is very significant. I mean, that's the most QE I've ever seen. Yeah. 
And I mean, they've been doing QE for a very long time. Mm. If you annualize that, you're talking about like 30% of GDP. Sure. You know, you can't keep doing that for too long because eventually yeah. the currency will just spiral out of control. Yeah. So I think um, what we've seen is that the Japanese investors, these are private investors in Japan, they invested around $3 trillion in global bonds because there were no yields back home. And about half that money is in the US. So they overweight US treasuries. And I suspect that they'll be, they became sellers of foreign bonds in late last year. And I suspect that that'll continue through the first half of this year. Mm. So that's kind of another reason why the dollar may be weakening is because you may, you know, and why the yen might have strengthened from 152 to 130 is that they might be bringing money back home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. Makes so sense. I think that that can, that can continue. Yeah. And then lastly, Russia and Ukraine, obviously we approaching the, the one year anniversary of this war and it goes on. Uh, I mean, if you've got any ideas there, it's, it's still a tail risk, I guess. But it's, I listened it's, to a military strategist um, uh, over the weekend and he was saying that wars end when one side surrenders or when you reach stasis for a long enough period of time. And, you know, like a winning party is not going to end the war. It, yeah. It'll have to be the, the losing party that's surrendering and we don't have, neither of them want to surrender. Yeah. I think we're closer to a stasis where, you know, you're not making that much progress, but the fighting continues. And that's something it'll just take time because eventually it becomes a cost benefit, you know, um, calculation where you say, well, we're losing so many men and we're not making any progress. So therefore we need to somehow negotiate our, our way out of this. So I don't foresee peace in the next couple of months. I mean, maybe in the second quarter is the, the soonest I can imagine when the stasis has run a period of time, mm. but the Ukrainians are getting new weapons. The risk for the Ukrainians really is that the West stopped sending their weapons and a debt ceiling issue could become problematic for Ukraine because if, uh, if some of the Republicans don't want to send any more money or weapons to uh, Ukraine, that'll become problematic for them unless they can get it out of Europe and they are getting some out of Europe, but that, yeah. you know, Europe is very far behind its sending. Yes. You know, then the war may end not because the Ukrainians want to, but because they run out of the weapons. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a risk, I think, for later in the year. Mm. Tactical nukes at the moment, I think, is on the back burner because she came out and told Putin that, he, you know, they will definitely not support anything like that, which I think is a positive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's where we are. So I think the stasis just continues. Yeah. It probably goes a little bit more in the background until you know they blow up a natural gas pipeline running through Ukraine or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lots to look out for and lots of insights from you as always, Nick. Um, we, we're out of our allotted time for this podcast, so I'm going to draw to a close. It's always fascinating speaking to you. Uh, your insights are always very very good. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me again and to do this first episode of Talking with Traders for the year with me. And I'm sure we'll look back on this podcast in months to come and have a look at how things are going, how how these, these situations have played out. Thanks. Pleasure. Thanks. That's good. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for joining me, Nick. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders, brought to you by IG, a world-leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.